next session for you today to discuss COVID-19 tools with our colleagues of the World Bank and the University of Oxford. Uh, I want to introduce um, our host today, who will be giving you some opening remarks and also take you to the different panels that we have prepared for you. Um, Samantha Newport is the Section Chief for Europe, Latin America, and the Caribbean and the Asia Pacific of the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, who will be giving you some opening remarks and take you to the next part of the session. Samantha, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Javier, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, colleagues, wherever you may be. I would like to welcome you um, to this uh, OCHA HDX dataset deep dive. Uh, this is our fourth, actually, that we, we are, have run. Um, and this has been organized by our humanitarian data exchange team in order to really highlight the most interesting data sets that we have on the platform, as Javier was just talking about. So today we're very pleased to welcome colleagues from the World Bank and from the University of Oxford's Blavatnik School of Government to present on their COVID-19 data. So a warm welcome to them. Um, before we get started, um, I just wanted to introduce myself. So I'm Samantha Newport and I work here in New York. I'm actually in the office, miraculously, uh, with OCHA uh, in the Operations and Advocacy Division. <clears throat> and of course, in my role, I collaborate on a regular basis with our Center for Humanitarian Data, which is actually based in The Hague. Um, and of course, at the moment, we're living through this global pandemic whose consequences can be felt everywhere. And in my role as section chief overseeing a, a large part of the world, I really needed a way to quickly track and understand, if you like, COVID trends in many countries and across large parts of the world. So the Center's COVID Data Explorer brings together dozens of data sets from more than 20 sources of information that help us make decisions about how best to prioritize our precious resources in a time of unprecedented need. And of course, my colleagues will go into that um, further on in this webinar. I also just wanted to take the opportunity to provide um, a little bit of the broader humanitarian context. Of course, at OCHA, the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs, that's um, very much our focus. And this year, we project that the number of people globally requiring life-saving humanitarian assistance will be 235 million women, men, girls, and boys. This is 40% more than last year, largely because, of course, of the pandemic, but 235 million people. The pandemic itself, of course, shows no signs of slowing. Um, we have actually about 27 million cases in the countries where we work as humanitarians. And every month we see that, um, of course, increasing. And we're very concerned about the new variants that could accelerate this trend. Um, and at the same time, we suffer in the humanitarian context of, um, you know, the picture being quite opaque. You know, testing is lacking, reporting is inadequate, etc. And we're constantly trying to overcome those <clears throat> challenges. But for many countries, it's not the virus that presents the greatest threat. It's actually been the secondary impact, you know, on livelihoods, on, on how people make a living, education, routine health services. And of course, we have very much seen a spike again in violence against women um, and girls. Um, in addition, 2020 saw the broadest collapse in per capita income since 1870 and extreme poverty is on the rise for the first time since 1998. The collapse of the health services as a consequence of the pandemic and the lockdown um, has also led to a very worrying drop of immunization rates for infants in their first year. Um, and last year, 80 million infants, 80 million infants in more than 60 countries didn't get the basic vaccines that they would have received the year prior. Um, famine is something that is also very much um, on the radar of uh, the United Nations and our humanitarian partners. In particular, we have Yemen, South Sudan and the Sahel. And global food prices in December were the highest for any month in the last six years. Um, and finally, 
you know, all of this, of course, uh, in order to respond requires uh, financial resources and the humanitarian response globally um, is still very underfunded. So at the end of December, the humanitarian response implemented by the United Nations and our partners, you know, uh, NGOs and others, was only 40% funded with donors providing 3.8 billion US dollars as of the end of December. Um, this year, uh, we aim to assist about 160 million people across 56 countries, and we are asking for $35 billion, so almost 10 times what we actually received uh, last year. And of course, humanitarian financing is just one piece of the puzzle, and it's not enough. We really need international financial institutions to provide greater support to poorer countries to deal with the economic impact of the pandemic. International financial institutions pledged $110 billion for COVID-19 related needs. Um, as of today, $11.7 billion um, that was targeted at low income countries. Um, of that, only $7 billion um, has been dis dispersed, which is about $10 per person. So we all collectively across the spectrum, and this I think is where you know it's very relevant that we have the three different organizations here today, we all collectively um, need to do more. So um, I would now like to introduce the uh, agenda, um, if that could uh, be put up on the screen, that would be fantastic, thank you. Um, so if you could all just take a quick look at the agenda, which was also um, shared beforehand. Um, and I would actually also like to introduce our speakers today um, who come from the University of Oxford and the World Bank, and they are both already sharing their data on our humanitarian data exchange. So our speakers are David Newhouse, who is a senior economist of the Poverty and Equity Global Practice with the World Bank. We also have Thomas Hale, who is an Associate Professor of Global Policy at the Blavatnik School of Government at the University of Oxford. And finally, we have Meta Sebia Sahlu, who is a data manager with us at the Ocha Center for Humanitarian uh, Data. So I will now hand over and then I will be back to moderate the questions and answers. Thank you very much uh, again for joining this and um, Let's 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 get started. Thank you. Thank you, Samantha. Um, a very warm greetings from Nairobi. Um, once again, welcome to the fourth webinar in our series of data uh, deep dives. We want to start today by giving you a live demonstration of the center's COVID-19 data explorer. Our team built the data explorer at the request of humanitarian leaders to help them make better decisions about aid allocation and distribution. The visual brings together dozens of data sets from more than 25 sources for the 63 countries listed in the UN's Global Humanitarian Response Plan for COVID-19. Karim, if you can make me a presenter now, I'd like to show, share my screen. I hope you can see my screen now. Okay, so here is the initial view of the uh, COVID-19 Data Explorer. You can see we have a number of data sets in the first panel on the left side. When I click on COVID-19 cases and deaths, you can see that uh, there's more uh, information displaying on the second panel giving us this uh, information in terms of number of countries, 63 countries, total confirmed cases, 27 million, number of recorded deaths, 20, uh, 750 uh, thousand. And this data is coming from the World Health Organization. Uh, I can also use this uh, drop down in the first panel to filter by region. You can see the second panel and the map have changed to reflect the caseload for the HRP countries only. We also have a lot of data um, when we hover over countries. 
for example, for Libya, I can see uh, lots of additional indicators. This is true for all of the categories of data listed in the first panel. If I want to draw, um, if I want to see more, uh, I, I can go into the chart view. This is uh, uh, our most commonly used filter. You can see the grows in cases over time. And if I hover over the curve, you can see the numbers changing over time. Coming back to the map view, I want to uh, focus on our most recent addition, the severe acute malnutrition. Uh, see here we have the sort function and be able to stack these values from lowest to highest, as well as highest to lowest. We also have the Oxford's COVID-19 government stringency index. Note how the second panel and the legend uh, change as we select different data categories. And we also have the international financial institutions um, financing data, including funding from the World Bank and other regional development banks. Last but not least, uh, we can use the country dropdown with additional data layers that we can toggle on and off. For example, for Afghanistan, internally displaced persons by province can be seen this way. Finally, going back to the main global view, we can see uh, on the top, we have the daily and monthly highlights. These are the reports. Here's one of those reports. Uh, this is how it looks like. The last thing I want to mention is that we are looking to improve this uh, visual and we are starting to do survey and user to learn how we can uh, make it more useful. So please don't hesitate to reach out to us um, directly or use the feedback button at the bottom of the screen here to send us uh, your feedback. So I'll close by highlighting uh, the data sets uh, for you, the data set page for University of Oxford and um, the World Bank. This is the data set page for the University of Oxford. As I've uh, shown earlier, it can be accessed from the COVID-19 Data Explorer as well as the pandemic page. And here we have the page for the World Bank uh, in 90 high frequency indicators data. It can be accessed from the pandemic page. Of course, they both can be accessed from the HDX homepage, data.humdata.org using the search feature uh, with keywords World Bank and Oxford. Um, we will also be uh, dropping the links to these data sets in the chat box. So that's all from my side. Thank you all for tuning. Um, back to you, Samantha. Thank you very much. Um, I would now like to hand the floor to Thomas Hale, Associate Professor of Global Policy at the Blavatnik School of Government at the University of Oxford. Over to you, Thomas. Thank you, Samantha, and thank you to everyone for joining us today. It's a real pleasure to be able to share the work you've been doing and just show everyone how we can uh, improve our analysis of COVID-19 and the responses to it by working together and combining the kinds of data you find on the HDX site that um, is just being explored. So um, if you go to the next slide, please, I can, I'd like to just take five minutes to quickly talk about what is in the Oxford COVID-19 Government Response Tracker and how we can use that information, hopefully, to answer questions that are relevant to the pressing humanitarian crisis that Samantha described so solemnly and grimly at the start of this session. What the tracker does is aim to provide a systematic cross-national, cross-temporal measure 
of different kinds of government responses to COVID-19. And this information we think can help us answer some really critical research questions and policy questions that are pressing, pressingly important as we think about how to calibrate and improve our responses to this pandemic. Um, it helps us understand what leads governments to adopt different policies, what effects those policies have, and importantly, how those effects might vary across different populations, across different countries and contexts. Um, next slide, please. So what does that mean in practice? Um, it's actually a, a huge amount of work being done by a massive global team of volunteer data contributors from all over the world. Um, it's a citizen science approach, if you will. We ask this massive team of uh, volunteers who are dedicated to providing this global public good, this global collective good, um, to go and search government websites, newspapers, etc., to try to um, categorize and code government responses on a whole different range of indicators every week. And I do this all the time uh, in their spare time to make sure the data is up to date and available to everyone. Um, next slide, please. The data cover uh, a, a whole range of different kinds of government policies. Broadly, we can group them into three broad areas, what we call closure and containment policies, or lockdown, if you will, things like school closings and workplace closings, um, health indicators around testing and contact tracing, um, and now increasing the vaccination, and economic policy indicators like income support or debt relief. Um, and we capture this information in a coding system that puts each of these policies into a common ordinal scale. So for example, for workplace closings, you might say there's no policy in place, or there's a limited closing or a total closing, um, a different degrees of severity. And that allows us to roughly compare the intensity and the presence of different government responses in common areas. Of course, we also record the underlying qualitative information in our notes with direct sources, so you have also access to the, um, exactly what's being done in different countries. But to make that very heterogeneous, complicated information legible and uh, understandable, we also combine these different specific indicators into various indices that um, give a quick numerical snapshot of the number and intensity of government responses in a given area um, at any given moment. And as has just been presented, the stringency index, um, which appears in HDX, is our summary of the closure and containment policies. You see how much lockdown, if you will, is being done in different places at different times. This information covers over 190 countries, and also a growing number of subnational jurisdictions and then a number of larger countries. Um, and as it's most important, it's freely available online, updated continuously, um, either through HDX or through our project page. Uh, next slide, please. So let me just close by saying a few things of what that helps us to see. Um, first, it can help us see some important macro patterns um, across government responses. So this graph is showing you um, the situation on, on closure and containment policies, uh, our stringency index, if you will, for every country in the world from the uh, start of last year through to the present. Um, and what you can see, uh, every line is a different country, um, and the color of that line shows how restrictive the policies are in the country at the time. So the more red, the more restrictive. Um, the white circles instead show you when that country experienced its first uh, 10 deaths to COVID-19. So if you will, the circles are a rough proxy for when um, COVID uh, began to spread seriously in a country. And what you can see is an interesting mismatch between um, when government policies begin to come into place and when COVID-19 actually spreads through countries. What we actually see is that most countries took action and in other words became red in our scale in this narrow two week window around the middle of March, 2020. Those are the two vertical lines you see on the left side of the graphs. Um, and what that shows us is that government policies aren't necessarily following the epidemiological situation in the country, i.e. the spread of COVID, but actually responding to other factors. For example, that was when the World Health Organization declared a global pandemic. Um, this is important to understand um, because as um, said before, and as we'll see more in a moment, these policies can have really important implications, not just for COVID-19, but also for other kinds of outcomes we care about, economic outcomes, for example, employment outcomes, health outcomes, conflict outcomes. Um, and here, uh, we need to make sure we're, under, we're, we're using them effectively. Um, next slide, please. And this will be the last one. So that was the macro view, but also the data is useful for drilling into more depth on the micro patterns. So as I said, for a number of countries, we see actually huge heterogeneity across large jurisdictions. Um, this is a graph for the United States, but the same can be said, of course, for Brazil, 
or um, or other countries where to have a lot of localized responses. Um, and what you can see on the left hand side there, not in much detail, but you can see the general shape. All the different US states have very different kinds of stringency indices, um, correspondingly different um, levels of cases uh, for, to, uh, to COVID-19. Um, and if you look at that in the aggregate national picture, you lose a lot of that granularity. So um, we're hoping to make the data increasingly granular so you can really zoom in and see what is the policy situation in a given place at a given time so you can begin to relate it to other outcomes that we care about. So that's all, and there is a quick snapshot of what we're capturing in the database, but I just really want to add, we're very excited to see how we can combine this information with more and more other measures um, in HDX and other sources to ensure that we're able to answer the analytic questions that are really pressing to allow decision makers to address these huge challenges. Thanks very much, back to you, Samantha. Thank you very much, Thomas. Um... Greatly appreciated. I'm now going to pass to David, David Newhouse, who's the senior economist in the poverty and equity global practice of the West Bank. Thank you very much, David, and you have the floor. Thank you very much, Samantha. I'd like to echo Thomas in saying how much of a pleasure it is to be able to present to everybody um, about how different organizations can combine their data to address the pressing humanitarian crisis that Samantha described in the introductory remarks. I'm going to talk a little bit about the high frequency dashboard that the World Bank has developed, but more about the high frequency phone survey data that this dashboard utilizes. It became quite apparent as the COVID-19 crisis unfolded that the socioeconomic impacts were going to be large and widespread, yet they were also going to vary considerably across groups, location, and time, and that we didn't know how long this crisis would last. At the same time, our traditional data tools for monitoring socioeconomic welfare were inadequate to the task. Traditional surveys are often outdated and not easily updated. Data collection, face-to-face -face data collection was suspended in most countries. And so we needed a new tool to try to assess the impacts of the COVID-19 crisis on households. Many units of the bank banded together to very quickly field high-frequency phone surveys in a number of countries. These sought to provide timely and accurate data on the socioeconomic impacts of the crisis to allow us to compare impacts across geographic areas in time. And in the future, we hope they can be used to track progress in vaccination. Next slide, please. We aim for these surveys to be nationally representative, to contact between one and 2,000 households per survey round, and there are two methods to conduct the sampling. In some countries, random digit dialing was employed to contact phone owners. In other countries, recent household surveys were used as a sampling frame to recontact the respondents of those pre-crisis surveys. The high frequency phone surveys have been conducted every one or two months. We intend for these to last for six to 12 months. They're conducted by phone. They cost about $30,000 per round. And the bank has worked very closely with national statistics offices in most countries to conduct these. We used a modular structure for the survey. There is a core recommended questionnaire, but we allowed individual country teams the flexibility to, mo to modify that questionnaire as needed to address country specific concerns. Next slide, please. Nonetheless, the wide coverage of the surveys and the fact that they were based on a common core questionnaire allows us to monitor and analyze the data at scale. Um, and these data have been a key input into the global dashboard that has been launched based on the ex post harmonized survey data um, that the World Bank's Data for Goals team has harmonized to a common standard. The dashboard currently contains 45 countries and 88 surveys. It mostly reports on national aggregates from the surveys but also disaggregate some of the data by urban rural location and industry of work for workers. In addition, the World Bank also conducted firm surveys in 51 countries. Um, some statistics from these firm surveys have been published in a paper, but these are not yet included on the dashboard. Next slide, please. One concern, which I think is important to mention, is that these surveys are not necessarily fully nationally representative. The first and obvious point is that they only represent phone owners within a country. 
However, it's possible to use standard statistical techniques to reweight the surveys to be more representative. And based on the initial work we've done so far, it seems like this reweighting has been largely been successful in terms of seeing characteristics of the phone surveys that on aggregate match pre crisis uh, nationally representative surveys. Another problem or issue is that many surveys overrepresent household heads. This is the case in several countries where we recontacted households based on a pre-crisis survey, and it was only possible to talk to one respondent in the household, and that respondent tended to be the head. This can complicate comparisons of individual characteristics, especially labor market outcomes and gender, um, because we do not necessarily see the full picture within the household of what's happening. Next slide, please. Um, nonetheless, we believe this is a tremendous resource for monitoring the socioeconomic impacts of COVID-19 um, and probably provides the best close to real-time information on the welfare impacts of the crisis on households in different countries. The countries covered in the, in the dashboard so far represent about a fifth of the world's population. They come from a variety of regions with Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America and the Caribbean best represented and a variety of income groups. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, these have been made available in the COVID-19 High Frequency Survey Dashboard. One can easily Google World Bank High Frequency COVID Dashboard to obtain the link to get it. This dashboard provides several features. Um, it can map aggregate results. It can perform cross tabs by urban and rural and industry of work. It can look, you can use it to look at trends or produce two-way scatter plots of different variables. Thank you very much for taking the time to listen to this, and I would encourage everyone to check out the dashboard, which is updated every month from now for the foreseeable future to see the latest information that these surveys are providing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. Um, greatly appreciated, and thank you to the three presenters. I mean, I think that um, it's incredibly interesting and, of course, testament um, you know, to the fact that uh, need is the mother of creation, as we say. So um, thank you. Thank you very much for this. I think we are now going to go um, in the interest of time straight into the second um, part of our event today, uh, which is about combining the data sets for new insights. Um, and we have two presenters today. Um, who are going to, um, you know, provide an overview on this. So the presenters are uh, Ife Nzegu Edochi, a data scientist with the Poverty and Equity Global Practice at the World Bank, and Anna Petherick, who is a departmental lecturer in public policy at the Blavatnik School of Government at, at Oxford University. So over to you, Ife and Anna, um, for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Samantha. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Ify Dochie, and uh, I will be presenting some of the work we've been trying to do, understanding the impact of uh, government policies, combining Oxford's COVID um, government response tracker and the World Bank's high frequency phone survey indicator. Next slide, please. Um, so we, we, we began by sort of looking at trying to explore the relationship between Oxford's um, CGRT um, stringency index uh, data and our household income and employment uh, dynamics, which we care about based from the uh, World Bank's high frequency phone survey indicator. Um, the goal here is to sort of present uh, in this presentation will be for us to present some of the preliminary exploratory analysis we've been doing, uh, trying to combine both data sets. Uh, towards being able to inspire future research um, on the impact of the way COVID is affecting people's lives, uh, specifically socioeconomic dynamics and behavior. Um, next slide, please. So we have tried to uh, combine uh, Oxford's COVID uh, government response tracker as well and the World Bank High Frequency Phone Survey. Uh, Oxford's uh, data at the moment is collected on a daily basis, and the World Bank's data is collected monthly at the national level. Uh, one of the things that we've tried to do is uh, combine both data sets by taking monthly averages of Oxford's um, COVID government response uh, indices and 
merge that to the World Bank's high frequency phone survey by country, uh, year, and month. Uh, next slide, please. So we've done our analysis essentially along two broad dimensions. The first thing we've tried to do is to look at the contemporaneous relationship between the stringency index and the outcomes that we care about. So how does the country's lockdown policy today relate to the employment dynamics that we care about? In this case, the percent of respondents who stopped working since COVID-19. Um, and you can see as expected that uh, as the stringency increases in countries, so does the percent of respondents who stopped working since the COVID-19 outbreak. And we've tried to sort of put some, uh, we, we, we have the, the, the strength of that relationship in the R values that you see on the chart on the, on the top left, as well as the slope of the lines as well, just to show as well that as the relationship, this relationship tends to wane as we look at the stringency index in the previous month. So how does the relationship between the stringency index in the previous month relate to the percentage of respondents who stopped working since, COVID, since the COVID-19 outbreak in the present month? And how does the relationship between stringency two months before relate to the uh, percent of respondents who stopped working since COVID-19 outbreak in the present month. And you see this relationship tends to wane over time. Part of the reason we're doing this is so that we can start, start to transition into being able to think about sort of more causal impact. At the, at the moment, however, we are focused on looking at just the correlation. Next slide, please. Likewise, we have also tried to look at the relationship between stringency and income dynamics. So how does the sh how does a more stringent lockdown in a country look with, with, with regards to the percent of households that experience a decrease in total income? Um, and, we, and, and as expected, you will notice that as the stringency increases, the percent of households that experience a decrease in total income also tends to go up. However, you will also notice as well that that relationship tends to be stronger um, as we look at stringency in the previous month or stringency two months before. Um, and so this perhaps points to the fact that we need to do more analysis on this to sort of see why this uh, is the case. Next slide, please. Um, finally, I think it's important that I mention here that our analysis focuses specifically on correlations rather than causation. Further analysis would be needed for us to be able to sort of identify and be able to measure the causal impacts that might exist. And that's sort of where we're headed to. Um, we are currently exploring more analysis that sort of tries to bring in uh, the humanitarian um, data coming out of UN, um, UN OCHA to try to link policies um, to sort of the household level, uh, in, uh, level outcomes that we care about. Um, a few examples of some of the things we're doing at the moment, in addition to what, we've, what I've already shown, we're sort of looking at the COVID uh, death rates per million and how that uh, explain the relationship between the, the outcomes, the individual level of, and household outcomes we care about and COVID death, uh, death rates per million. Um, the other thing that we are trying to do as well is to, is to look at how, how whether, be able to answer the question of whether countries with UN interagency human, humanitarian response plans show a different relationship between the stringency index and the employment dynamics that we already talked about than other countries that don't have um, the humanitarian response plans. Um, so yes, thank you. That's what we've done so far. Wonderful. So uh, my name is Anna Petherick and I'll just jump straight in because I see we're short for time. So um, the uh, Oxford Tracker project is mostly a, a, a policy data project, um, producing data for other people to use. But of course, Tom and I are researchers. So I was going to show you what we've been finding when we have combined this data with different kinds of behavioral data. Now, uh, there's huge value in one kind of behavioral data, and that has, has been around throughout this uh, pandemic period, and that is mobile phone mobility data. And the value here is that it is objective data, but it has shortcomings. It's aggregate to population levels, and it's also not very detailed in terms of the type of behaviors we can track. So here we have um, two graphs on the left. Uh, we show how mobility in Brazil in terms of staying at home has been changing throughout each week 
starting before policies were introduced and then following through essentially the first period of lockdown. And so the red dotted line going across shows the moment when Brazilian states pretty much all at once uh, implemented the first lockdown. And so we can see that mobility nudged in a, it, it jumped. And then what is interesting is that we started to see a, a reduction over time in how much people were actually staying at home while this lockdown was in place. But also all the way through to June from March, the, the, the rate of staying at home is not close to returning to what it was before the policies were introduced. We then started looking at uh, countries all over the world using Google data. Now these are slightly different models and the way to read them is the dotted line going across this time indicates the degree of compliance with policies in the first month when policies, when closure and containment policies were brought in. And then along the bottom, along the x-axis, you have months. Um, so each dot represents a month. So here in the first panel, panel A, we see a reduction in compliance um, in terms of uh, staying in residential locations over time. There's a drop suddenly, and then it's sort of, there's a pattern where it sort of levels off and perhaps recoils a bit. We see on the right hand panel, an increase in the extent to which people are, are visiting retail and recreation places, again, controlling for policy strength. And a similar pattern, but in reverse, that you just expect. In both cases, we're seeing a kind of behavioural fatigue. If we could have the next slide, please. So here, we're doing something, I think, which is even uh, more interesting, and that is we're combining our data and similar models with survey data. Now, there are huge advantages in survey data over mobility data. And one is that you can look in far more detail at the types of behaviours. And you can also look at how different groups in society are behaving differently. So in the left hand graph, there is there's a, a very similar graph to what you saw before. So the first panel, panel A, shows the same patterns. You read it in the same way. So here we have physical distancing behaviours. People have responded to say that they've been avoiding going to gatherings and going out in the past week. And again, you see this drop off over time and perhaps a slight recall. Now, what's interesting is when we run the same models, but instead of looking at physical distancing, we look at mask use, and that's panel B in the left hand graph. Now, here we see compliance going up and up and up and up every month. So uh, the way we think about this is there are different kinds of behavior policies. There are high cost policies that are probably accumulating over time. And then there are low cost policies that are habituating, rather like wearing a seatbelt. And mask wearing is one of these. Now, if we look in the right hand graphs, we just compare our fatigue patterns for physical distancing for different societal groups. And here, what is in fact, I think most fascinating is we don't see huge differences in the extent to which adherence is changing over time for different groups. Um, we do see some differences, particularly for people with and without chronic diseases. But perhaps for me, the most interesting thing is we don't see differences for different kinds of employment that people are working with are unemployed. And that suggests that perhaps causally, and we're not getting at that formally, but causally we might, we might think that maybe it's not to do with need that people are breaking compliance. They're not going out primarily to earn money, but it's a, perhaps a more psychological thing, really being sick of the pandemic or, or being sick of these uh, strong policies. So I, I just wanted to say one word about the future, and that is that I see a huge amount of potential, particularly for combining our data, um, the Oxford data with uh, survey data. The, the, what I've shown you here uses 14 countries of survey data from YouGov, but obviously we'd like to do the whole world, which the mobility data also does. And we'd like to ask questions that get to get us more calls or leverage. In particular, how are people's risk perceptions changing over time? And how is that, how are behaviours changing, different kinds of behaviours as people receive vaccines and to track individually if people are getting vaccines and income support? And of course, if people are experiencing psychological fatigue. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Ify, and thank you very much, Anna. I mean, super interesting to see how all of this is still evolving, right, as, we, as we're all still learning as the pandemic continues. Um, so I'd like to take a few questions now. I'd also like to point to the fact that there are questions in chat, and there are also questions in the Q&A box um, for our participants. So um, people seem to be using both, and that's absolutely fine, and where we can answer in writing. We're answering in writing, and um, otherwise they will be picked up um, by our panelists here. Um, so I understand actually that we have a question from Ambar Narayan. Um, he's the lead economist in the global directors team at the World Bank, and I believe Ambar, you would like to come in. Um, you would like to come in. So over to you. Thank you. You're on yeah, this mute. Is Kareem. Oh, yeah. Ambar is having technical issues. You may want to go to our second question while Ambar connects his microphone. We can come back and try it. Sure. Then I think I would like to go to the question that is in the Q and A that was posted by Rania Rania Elisawi. Um, thank you so much for these interesting presentations and the richness of the data that has been generated. Would be interested to know how this data is feeding back to the humanitarian response platforms at country level, who receives it, reviews it. Um, Javier, perhaps over to you to answer that question, if I may. Hello, can, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Perfect. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Rania, for that question. So all these data sets can be easily downloaded from the platform and are accessible to, the, to either the Data Explorer or also through XDX. So uh, data is in machine readable formats. So our co uh, colleagues and people in the field can easily access this information and use them for their different reports. So um, data is also validated in the sense that uh, data set comes with a piece of metadata so you can see where the data is coming from, what's the methodology that has been used to collect the date of the data set, so how fresh the data is. And all this is taken into account for analysis whenever is those data sets are downloaded by our colleagues in the field of, or by our community. I hope this answers this question. Thank you very much, Javier. If I may also add, you know, the raison d'etre of the Center of the Human of Humanitarian Data is really very much about enriching um, the data that is available in the humanitarian sphere that has perhaps not progressed um, as swiftly as data collection and analysis in, in other walks of life. Um, so I think that actually the Data Explorer has also provided a, a, a very good opportunity to showcase a lot of the work that the United Nations and all of our humanitarian partners are doing on the ground in terms of the data collection, which we know is, is very challenging in many of the contexts where we work. Um, I believe Ambar is now um, connected. Over to you, Ambar. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, sorry for the little bit of trouble in connecting. Uh, no, so I'll, I'll, I'll just use my opportunity to ask two questions. Uh, the first is to actually to all the participants, but not the World Bank, because I kind of know the answer, but uh, to both OTA and uh, and uh, Oxford, that, you know, how do you plan to update your data, particularly in the light of what is going to be happening now, which is essentially, you know, vaccination is the big sort of elephant in the room uh, as vaccines get rolled out. Uh, and we also expect, uh, you know, a lot of inequities to be emerging. So there is a there's an enormous public value in being able to track the rollout of vaccination, particularly in the low income countries and 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 in the sort of the fragile and uh, countries and so on. So so so, and for Oxford, I, I know how you collect your data, but is there are there any specific steps that you're taking through your volunteers to to get information on vaccine policy, perhaps? Um, because uh, because that's different from the kind of stringency policy stringency you've been tracking. The second question is actually to both the World Bank and and the and Oxford team, Anna and Effie. Uh, great presentation, by the way. Uh, I'm just wondering if you are if you are also planning to look at the impact of certain types of policy stringency or changes in policy stringency 
on employment and income indicators. And I'm particularly interested in you know, the kind of policy stringency which would affect, for example, women's uh, ability to, to stay in their jobs or, 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 or to enter the labor market. So policies related to you know, school openings uh, or childcare. Um, and, and there's a lot of variation across countries and within countries as well, including in the United States, where you know, every locality is struggling with this question. Um, and this probably has a lot of impact on, 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 on sort of the gender disaggregated impacts. And if you're planning to look at that, as well as other impacts, labor market related impacts of, of basically social policies, which are to do with the interruption of certain types of services, specifically school and childcare are the, come that are the ones that come, uh, you know, sort of are, are probably the most important on employment related outcomes. Uh, that's all, thank you. And great presentations, everybody. Thank you, Amber, and um, and good to see you. Um, perhaps to on the the first question on updating the data and looking at uh, vaccine policy, et cetera, and addressing inequities. If I could perhaps first hand over to um, Oxford and then uh, to Ocha. Thank you. Thanks, Amber. Great question. So um, we are collecting information on, of course, the closure and containment policies that went into the index, but also the health and economic policies that complement them. And starting in December, we started collecting information on. Um, one of those health indicators being vaccine policy. So a crude measure of how available a vaccine is to um, how wide a segment of the population. I shall put into the chat um, the link to our colleagues at our world of data who have, who have visualized that um, data that's coming in. Um, so that, that's an up, uh, updated data is, is there free for everyone's use. Um, but it's a, because it's such an important topic, we're also going to make sure we're going to expand on this going forward. And actually, we're going to start um, in the next weeks, creating a suite of vaccine indicators, so not just capturing vaccine policy in this um, one sense, but actually a whole range of different vaccine policies, who can get it, um, what the, the distribution is. We won't, they'll be tracking um, how many vaccines are being delivered or the kind of production and, and um, issues. Uh, those are other parts of the ecosystem our focus is really on policy. Um, but again, we hope this can be a useful complement to those additional measures. Thank you. Um, perhaps over to you, Javier, to talk about the updating of the of the data. Sure. Yeah. So uh, thank you for. The we update the dashboard um, for many sources. We have an API update, so that means the the updates are automatic. So whenever the data is refreshed in our with our colleagues in WHO, for instance, the data is reproduced on the dashboard. Some others needs a bit of a manual upload, but we, we are after each of the organizations to update those numbers in the dashboard. Like for instance, the schools closures that we follow and we, and we download from UNESCO website and, and those numbers are reproduced in the dashboard. We also try to catch up with the vaccinations as you were mentioning. So uh, uh, the colleagues from uh, University of Oxford, our world in data, they're already collecting these, this information for selected countries for a small group of countries, but nevertheless, they are already part of XDX. So we we want the dashboard not to become, uh, you know, a, 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 a dead tool. So the, the these are sometimes daily, sometimes happens twice per day, as is in the case of the ritual. But all the data, we, I think we're gonna be with this pandemic for a little bit of time. So we, this is our top priority to keep it up to date uh, as much as possible. Thank you very much, uh, Javier. Perhaps I could just uh, hand over to David Curry, who said um, that he would like to answer some of the questions on the on the vaccine issue. Over to you, David. Or perhaps he doesn't have the ability to um, to do that. Just turn on David's audio. David, go ahead. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I, I raised uh, two questions in the Q and A, and my last entry was that if it were helpful, I would be happy to speak to them. Uh, I, I may have some answers. Uh, the questions I raised uh, dealt with the uh, relatively rapid emergence. Uh, obviously not in LMICs and in humanitarian context of a number of different vaccine candidates, 
some of which have been uh, have received emergency use listing by WHO, but a number of which are in circulation, if you will, without any stringent regulatory authority approval or even review and without um, the typical clinical trial data that would allow that in circulation. My question for the project, and, and please let me applaud the recognition of the opportunity and the effort to try to harmonize and integrate where possible these different uh, collection and dashboard kinds of efforts. Our concern, because we can already see it in a few instances, is that uh, countries who, who may be able to source what I'll call fully uh, approved emergency use vaccines, like the Pfizer vaccine or the Moderna vaccine, but also may be sourcing what I'll call second tier vaccines, which do not have that regulatory approval, may find uh, an inclination to be shunting uh, those uh, second tier vaccines to non-citizens, to camps, to humanitarian context. We're extremely concerned about how vaccines are distributed equitably but we're equally concerned about the quality of the vaccines and who is receiving uh, which tier. So without getting too deep into the weeds, um, I'm just wondering if you, as the vaccine picture begins to clarify, as COVAX begins to kick in, but also these bilateral deals which continue to multiply, if the projects may be anticipating um, monitoring of what is actually happening and what vaccines are making their way to different populations, particularly vulnerable populations. Um, and, and maybe I'll, I'll pause there. I hope that's clear. And let me again applaud the, the data sets that you are already collecting. And I can see that you are opening the door to, to vaccines related data as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Um, if you could just put in the chat um, where you work, I, I think that would be very interesting. Um, thank you very much. Um, I also just wanted to flag that we are also um, at OCHA looking at how to include vaccine rollout data for countries in humanitarian settings. It is very important to track this, of course, but at the, the challenge at the moment is essentially that the vaccine rollouts haven't begun in the countries where, where OCHA operates. Um, there are actually more questions coming up uh, in the in the chat and the Q&A, but I'd like to go to Ambar's second question, which was about the impacts um, and, and looking at employment and income indicators um, and, and the labour market related impacts of, of social policies. Perhaps um, over to World Bank colleagues first for that. I don't know if, uh, if, if he or David, you would like to um, answer that question posed by Ambar, and then I will pass over to Oxford. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, Sam. So I fully agree with Ambar that the nexus between school opening policies and labor market impacts, especially for women, is hugely important. I think the high frequency phone survey data that the World Bank is collecting has potential to speak to this. Uh, we can use it to look at the uh, relationship when we get the Oxford data on school, if there is Oxford data or other data on school closure, between school closure and household income changes. In addition, in the countries where the, the either the high frequency phone survey data or other survey data asks about labor market impacts of everyone in the household, we can get a clear picture of how the, those policy changes are affecting women and men and how they behave and how they behave in the labor market in particular. So I think that's a promising avenue for further research. Thank you very much. Um, over to Oxford University. Hi, yes, yeah, so I think these are incredibly important questions. And we have, um, we have been running surveys ourselves actually to, um, to gather the data where we could answer them, um, I guess, with a sort of sense of uh, people's history over the course of the pandemic. So many of the, of the large surveys that are out there are cross-sectional surveys, meaning that a different group of people in each country are asked with each round. 
So we've been running very detailed surveys in nine cities in Brazil, so the same people are answering each time. And the idea here is to follow, quest, follow um, uh, behaviours of households over time. So we're absolutely interested in looking at the, the question of how does a city's level of stringency and particular policies, combinations, say school closures and workplace policies, all of that stuff, how does it affect household um, changes? So we, we can tell if that how many children in a household how they're being educated at home or not, the, the gender of the children, the number of people who share a bedroom. And we're following this in rounds repeatedly because we really want to do these detailed surveys. Of course, the problem is that running panel surveys rather than cross-sectional surveys is really difficult to do and almost impossible to do probably for the whole world during COVID. But hopefully we can, we can at least get somewhere and then think about what we call external validity in academia later but I'll, I'll let you know when we've done those with those analyses Thank you very much. I, I really appreciate that. So, folks, I'm I'm just looking at the clock. I'm seeing that there are still um, a lot of questions, but I I think that uh, with an event of this size, we we absolutely need to uh, finish, of course, on time. Um, I did want to mention that all of the questions in the chat are logged, and so if if we haven't been able to answer them, then the team. Uh, will reply by email to the ones that we didn't get to. I think there was a lot of there was a bit of crossover, and, and I believe that some of them were were answered. We're also going to send a follow up email today with the links um, and the video, uh, etc. Um, so really, I would just um, I'm going to hand back to Javier, but I would like to thank all of the participants, um, you know, for joining this webinar, our fourth deep dive. You know, we hope that we're going to be doing many more, and of course, we will be touching base, you know, with with our colleagues working on these three tools to see how everything everything develops. Um, but thank you very much, and of course, uh, stay stay safe wherever wherever you may be. Over to you, Javier. Thank you. Thank you, Sam, and thank you to all our panelists. Just to say that all the data that we have been presenting here and showing in the different dashboards can be downloaded and accessed on XDX, not only on the Data Explorer, but also by going to the XDX website, uh, where you can find not only the data related to COVID-19, but also to a lot of humanitarian uh, crisis around the world. Um, you will see that there are a little more than 20,000 data sets from more than 300 organizations, but still we are looking for more data. So we're still looking for disaggregated data that could help us understand the different crises around the world. So if your organization is collecting data and you want to share it, please register on XDX or contact us. We will have an email put in very soon on the screen. So you can reach at us and just go to data.comdata.org and register register your organization and talk to us. So thank you again to everyone and everybody who came and joined our webinar. We have planned a series of webinars in the following months with also very relevant and actionable data sets on XDX. So stay tuned with us and thank you again and have a nice day. Bye everyone and thank you for coming. <laughs>